Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin. I welcome you here for preaching the gospel. I have my Bible open to 1 John chapter 3, and here in just a few moments, Lord willing, we'll delve into some of this context together. This chapter opens with that statement I just shared with you. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. You know, the Apostle Paul also had somewhat to say about the love of God. I remember how in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 19, he mentioned to the Ephesians about knowing the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Now think about that, somewhat of a paradoxical statement. How do you know something that passes knowledge? That's an interesting thought. But when it comes to the love of God, perhaps we can understand it like this. We can know the fact of God's love. In fact, there should be no doubt about that, hopefully in any of our minds. Romans 5 and verse 8, God commendeth or God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so forever, Calvary should stand as an attestation of the love of God forever attesting the fact that God loves you. God loves me. God loves all mankind. And that's demonstrated by the offering of Jesus on the cross. So we can know the fact of his love on the one hand. And yet, if we were to shift, so to speak, and if we were to begin discussing the depth, the degree, the extent of God's love, well, that might well be a very different matter. We, as finite human beings, we are not able to fully plumb the depths of God's love for man. We can know it. We know that he loves us, but something that passes knowledge is truly knowing and fully appreciating, perhaps, the depth and the extent of his love for man. And so maybe that's what Paul had in mind when he talked about knowing the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, Ephesians 3 and verse 19. But we're dealing here primarily today not with Paul and his inspired writings, but with John, the man known commonly by many as the apostle of love. And what he wrote by inspiration here in 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, he begins really with somewhat of an exclamation, we might say. Behold, grabbing the attention of his readers. Behold, what manner of love is this? What manner of love is this that God would make us his own very children. And so today, as we've entitled our sermon, Behold What Manner of Love, I want us to get into the context of 1 John 3 and verse 1. And as we do so, we'll draw out three major ideas, three major points. Point number one, let's begin with the fact of sonship. The fact of sonship. Notice verse 1 continues, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And then John elaborates. He gives us the the subject matter on which he's focusing, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, perhaps many of your modern translations will read children of God, and that's perfectly accurate. In the ancient Greek, when you were talking about children generically, they would often use the masculine gender. And so in one sense, technically, it could be translated sons of God, as we see in the old King James Version. But the meaning actually is simply children of God. And so what John is contemplating and what's at the forefront of his thinking as he writes what we know as the beginning of chapter 3 is, God has made us his children. How 
How can a sinless, holy, perfect God, a transcendent being, how can he condescend so as to make weak, frail, sinful people his children? And as John is contemplating that concept and that reality, that's when he says, behold, look at this. The word behold really means look here. Look at this. What manner of love God has bestowed upon us. So much, in fact, that he has made us his own children. And so there is, number one, the fact of sonship that we enjoy from God the Father. That is, we who have obeyed the gospel, we who have come to him through Jesus Christ, we have been adopted, we have been made his children. Now, I may underscore this in much the same way, perhaps, that that John would if, if he were resurrected and if he were with us here today. Perhaps he was thinking about passages like Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29, where the wise man pointed out that God hath made man upright but he has sought out many inventions or many evil designs, so to speak. So as we know from Ecclesiastes 7.29, and really as we know from the balance of biblical literature, God, when he created mankind, he, he created man holy. Adam and then Eve, the initial pair, at first they were sinless. They were holy and perfectly righteous before God. Now, sadly, that did not last very long. But initially, they were upright. God hath made man upright, but he has sought out many devices, many inventions. In other words, man has chosen his own path. Man has chosen sin. He has fallen into sin. Is there any way? Is there any way that sinful humanity, described in Romans 3.23 as falling short of the glory of God, is there any way that such could be made the children of God, the sons of God? And to that, John would reply, yes, behold, look at this. It's because of his love. It's because of the great love of God that God was willing to condescend and make us his children. Look with me to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3 at verse 26, you can read in your Bible, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to elaborate, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism is the doorway into Jesus, and Jesus is the only one whereby we receive that adoption, the adoption of children. And we read about that in Ephesians 1, verses 4, 5, and 6. And particularly there at the end of Ephesians 1 and verse 6, Paul would say that we have been made accepted in the beloved. We have been made accepted in Christ Jesus. Well, God's love gave us that Savior. God's love for Jesus, the beloved, that extends even to us. God loves us as his children, those of us in Christ. And so point number one, the fact of sonship. Now, point number two Think with me about the foes of sonship. And the sad reality is, when a man or a woman obeys the gospel, coming to Jesus Christ and submitting to the plan of salvation, yes, he or she is made a child of God. But the sad reality is now that not everyone around that person will necessarily be pleased with that decision. Not everyone will be enthused 
about another soul's obeying the gospel. Simply put, there are foes or enemies with whom we will meet because of our sonship, because we have become children of God. Notice here, this is the, the last half of 1 John 3 and verse 1. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The world did not know God, and because the world did not know God, the world does not know us. Why is it that people in the world, people who are not spiritually minded, they are not devoted to following what the Bible teaches, why is it that they do not understand us? Why is it that they do not better relate to us? And th those are intriguing questions, but if I may, I, I could offer a couple of things, perhaps. Number one, think about the difference in knowledge. The difference between what you and I know as children of God and what people outside of Christ, outside of His church, what they know out in the world. They don't know the same things. We don't know the same things together. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus would instruct His hearers saying, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Jesus was telling his disciples there that, that I want you to be seeking after the spiritual verities. I want you to be asking the right questions. I, I want you to be knocking, as it were, and the door will be opened unto you. People who seek God can know God. People who are seeking his will can know his will. But, but on the flip side of that, that means that men and women who are not seeking God they don't know his will. And so again, they don't know what you and I know, the difference in knowledge. And perhaps that's one of the fundamental reasons why the world cannot relate to us. They don't understand us. They don't know what we know. Another passage in John chapter 6, again speaking to those who had been following him, Jesus said in verse 27, Labor not for the meat or for the food that perisheth, but for the meat, the food, which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. There Jesus is emphasizing, of course, the spiritual over the physical, the eternal over the temporary. And he's telling us that we do not need to become preoccupied in our lives simply with this life and these temporal affairs. Instead, our focus really needs to be on the spiritual. Well, again, people in the world who do not apply themselves thus, they don't learn. Consequently, they don't know. And it's because of that difference in knowledge, no doubt to a great extent, that the world does not understand us. The world does not know or relate to us because first they do not know and relate to God. And so there are those that would consider us enemies. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 4 that those in the world, they think it's strange. 1 Peter 4, 4 they think it's strange that we do not run with them to the same excess of riot. In other words, we don't live our lives the way that they do. We don't uh, run into uh, or run unto rampant immorality and self-gratification and, and all manner of sins. We don't live that way. To us, that's not what, what life is about. And so Peter says, they think it's strange. <laughs> and indeed, they must. Indeed, they do. A difference in knowledge, but now that has brought us, as you can see presently, number two, 
That's brought us to a difference in behavior. Because the world doesn't know what we know in the gospel, the world doesn't live the way we live, and hopefully we do not live the way the world lives, and that will result in an obvious difference in behavior. We could go back to the context here in 1 John chapter 3. We've really only read verse 1 thus far, but if you were to move down to verse 3, 1 John 3, 3, John says, and every man that hath this hope in himself or in him, he purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now, you and I know that a man or a woman cannot live a pure life and actually be living life the way that the world does. Those are antithetical. Those are opposites. But what keeps us living a pure life to the best of our ability, according to this, is our hope. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And so there's a verse after 1 John 3, 1. Now back up with me into the conclusion of chapter 2 to a verse that appears before. 1 John 3, 1. Look at chapter 2 and verse 29. If ye know that he, referring to the Lord, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. And so our practice as we live the Christian life, our practice is to do righteousness. That's our custom. That's our manner of life. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not at all saying that Christian people are perfect. (laughs) That's not true. Christians are not sinless. We stumble. We fall. But there should be a marked difference in our behavior and the behavior of the world, the unconverted. There should be a marked difference. And if there is, then that helps us to understand why they would look at us as enemies, why there would be foes to our sonship, to our being the children of God. Stay in 1 John chapter 3 and and move down with me to verse 11, and John really clears this up. He says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, we we should not be as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore, or why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. And on the heels of that observation, John said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We don't want the world to hate us. We, we're not out looking to make enemies. We're not out trying to pick a fight per se. That's not what this is about. It's about fundamental differences, and you might say maybe a natural animosity that arises therefrom. Just as the darkness is naturally opposed to the light and the light to the darkness, So those of us who have become children of God, we're likely going to find a natural animosity between us and those in the world, particularly at times, particularly those in the world who have become militant. It's not enough for them to choose sin. It's not enough for them to rebel against God and against the Bible but that they have become militant. They want to insist that others rebel against God, others rebel against the Bible, others forsake God-given morality and the standards pertaining thereto. And so especially in those instances of militancy, we come to see the enmity that exists between children of God and children of the world. 
So number one, we've talked about the fact of sonship. God's love has made that possible. Number two, now we've talked about the foes, the enemies associated with our sonship. But now number three, let's talk about the future. The future of sonship. And believe you me, every saint has a past, but every sinner also has a future. And that's sobering when we think about the judgment that is coming toward uh, sinners, but it's thrilling when we think about it from the perspective of saints who are nothing more than reformed sinners. Our future is glorious. And we've already noticed 1 John 3 and verse 3, whosoever or every man that hath this hope in him, he purifieth himself even as he is pure. What hope? John described it as we read there, this hope, 1 John 3 and verse 3. What what particular hope is he talking about? This hope. Well, we had skipped over verse 2, but but now we we need to back up to verse 2 and you'll see the hope. Beloved, he addresses his readers, now are we the sons of God. That's the fact of our sonship. By the way, we don't wait until we get to heaven to be children of God. He says, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now. What John does there in verse 2 and and what he's building upon in verse 3 when he talks about cleaning up our lives and purifying our lives and and living in a pleasing way to God, what what he's talking about is that Jesus, number one, Jesus is coming back, okay? That's not made up. That's not preacher talk. That's not, certainly not Hollywood. That's just biblical truth. Jesus is coming back. Number two, when Jesus comes back, we're going to see him. In fact, John will tell us in Revelation 1 and verse 7 that all eyes, every eye shall behold him and see him. Even the the very Roman soldier who thrust the spear into his side, even he will see Jesus when he comes back. Now, that implies a resurrection. That Roman soldier has long since been dead, but if to his eyes, not so much the physical eyes, but the eyes of his resurrected body, if he too is going to see Jesus, then that must mean there'll be a resurrection. And Jesus tells us that, John 5, 28 and 29, there will be a universal resurrection. So Jesus is coming back. Everyone's going to see Jesus when he comes back. And here in writing to the children of God, John tells us, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So much, so much about the current glorified state of Jesus Christ that we simply do not know about. I mean, there are some things we do know. We we do know that he ascended from the Mount of Olives and that a cloud received him out of the sight of the apostles. And we do know that upon ascending back to heaven, that he came before the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and that there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom We do know that from Daniel 7, 13 and 14. We do know that he has taken his place seated at the right hand of God. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, we know that he's seated at the right hand of God. And we do know that seated there, he's making intercession for his people, his saints, even today, Romans 8 and verse 34. So so there's a lot that we know about the current state of Jesus Christ. 
But there's still a whole lot that we don't know about his glory, about how how does Jesus look right now? Well, we don't really know the answer to that. But what's thrilling about this is when he comes back, guess what? We will. We'll see him. John says, we're going to see him. And when we see him, we're going to be transformed. We're going to be made like unto him. He, in his glory, that's going to be reflected in us and in our new existence that we're given at his second coming, at the resurrection from the dead, at the changing of those who live in that final generation. Look at this with me. Leave John for a moment, and, and, and really we're probably quite through with John as far as our time goes. But back up with me to the book of Philippians. And let's go once more to the writings of the Apostle Paul. And at the close of chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, we find some very intriguing information. Chapter 3, verse 20, for our conversation is the old King James Version word. I think the new King James Version reads citizenship, and that gives us a, a clearer idea. For our citizenship is in heaven. Christian, do you think like that? Are you an American first, or are you a Christian first, who happens to be an American, perhaps? Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence, from heaven, also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we're looking, we're we're anticipating, we're awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. When he left earth, where did he go? He went back to heaven. So where are we looking for his return? We're looking toward heaven. And when he comes back, notice verse 21, who shall change, when he comes back, he's going to change our vile body. The word vile is not a good translation. He's going to change the body of our humiliation. We we currently live in a flesh and blood state. Before the God of eternity, that's quite humiliating. Because we are prone to sickness and even death, that's quite humiliating. Because the flesh is weak, we are vulnerable to sin. That's quite humiliating. This fleshly body is the body of our humiliation. But when Jesus comes back, He's going to change the body of our humiliation so that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. I don't know what that's like right now. I'll see it when he comes back. And when he comes back, he's going to change my body and your bodies as faithful children of his so that we are fashioned like unto him. And so simply put, As we contemplate it, that is the future of sonship. Thank you.